Thank you so much to the worship team for leading us. Happy Father's Day to me. Thank you. I have to wish myself. Somebody can come and give me a hug. <laughs> Come on, Jan, come and give me a hug here. Oh, I'll be fine to stay past that. <laughs> Thank you, Jan. You're my favourite. <laughs> Have you ever seen a man talking to himself? <laughs> ever seen that happening? Men regularly just have conversations with themselves. Just regularly. Don't ever stop him, please. Because, you see, every man is, he's the estate manager of his home. And if he's having a conversation he, with, with himself, he's having a staff meeting. <laughs> and if you interrupt him, he's never going to get the things done. Because he's having that staff meeting. So if you interrupt him, you know why things aren't getting done. Just let him be. Let him wander the estate, talking to himself. We're on week number nine of this series. Can you believe it? We got to week nine and survived. We've got one more week left in this series. At the end, there will be a test. On each of the names that you've gone through. Today, the name that we're looking at is Jehovah Nissi. This is a power name. A name where we look at um, God in terms of his power, what he's able to do. We're in a war as the church. The church is engaged in a war. You might not think that. Um, when you became a Christian, you didn't think that you... You signed up for battle. We're in a war. Thank you for the approval. <laughs> when you've been a Christian for long enough, you realize that there comes a time in our prayers that our prayers change from being just a prayer, Lord, will you give me this, give me that, will you sort this out, sort that out, to a prayer of engagement into the issues that you may be facing as an individual, or as a family, or maybe as a community, or maybe as a nation. Because those issues seem to be so big and so um, intimidating that you yourself don't have the strength or the ability to be able to deal with any of that. And so we realize that we are engaged in a war. And God is the one who fights that war. He, he leads his army out to fight that war. And what he calls the church to do is to pray. Last year, back in South Africa, you may have seen on the news, there were those running riots that happened in South Africa as... Um, there's various theories around it, but um, the one that seems to be sticking the most is when um, Jacob Zuma was imprisoned and the rioting started to happen. At that stage, um, in the suburb that was next to us, there was a, uh, a particular police station that we, we knew there was corrupt activity happening from. Uh, many, many cases were not being dealt with. Um, police wouldn't arrive at particular scenes, whether it would be a, an armed robbery or a murder. Um, um, that just wouldn't arrive. That just wouldn't come. Uh, we, could, we would notice that there were certain unmarked police cars that um, suddenly um, the occupants were very um, flush with cash. 
And knowing um, what was happening in the town, we began to do some investigation into that and found that the police vehicles were being used for the movement of illegal gold um, from one place to another, and the police officers were getting paid off um, by, by this illegal mining. Um, and and, and they, were being, they, they, they were moving per consignment roughly 4 million rand, which will be about probably close to about um, 350,000 uh, Australian dollars per consignment that they were moving. And that they, were, they were moving several vehicles a day uh, that was being moved. This gold that was being moved was being used to fund human trafficking and fund drug trafficking and arms dealing. That was being used to invade the farms that were around the town. When those riots happened, the citizens of the town held off. The police didn't arrive. The country ran out of ammunition, and it seemed like South Africa was on the brink of a civil war. What started to get linked back was that the commander of this particular police station was a corrupt official and was allowing this to happen. In fact, she was getting huge kickbacks. Where it really struck home was the one day when myself and one of the other chaplains, the, the two of us, were called to, um, to a, call it a fairly confidential, secret type meeting where there were um, military personnel who we didn't know who they were. Some of them were masked. And we were asked, because the two of us had been involved in military intelligence, to please assist that there is going to be a farm invasion. Approximately 30 armed men will be hitting this farm within the next couple of days. They had already received the warnings the guys had already staked the farm out. They knew everything that was there. Um, they were going to be using high caliber weapons. The farm had the mother and, and the father, the two children with their wives, and four children under the age of six. And the heartbreaking thing was sitting with them and saying to them, there is a 90% chance you will die. And when they get hold of you, it won't be pretty. They will rape your wives in front of you. They will torture your children to death in front of you. And then they will execute you one by one. This is the reality you are facing. But this is what you can do. How you barricade yourself into the house, how you communicate with us on the outside as the guys will infiltrate by helicopter and try and get you out. You need to buy between 8 to 10 minutes of time to survive. We need 8 minutes to get on the ground. If we have any hiccup, or if they move slightly faster, all is over. We know the colonel from the police station will send no police out. We are on our own. And so we began to pray. Because he knew that it was almost impossible. Um to be able to fight this. The way the farm had been set up, the compost heaps were around the house, which meant that um, use of drones and thermal imaging was impossible because they would just lie on the compost heaps and you couldn't pick up where the guys were. The buying of time was not possible. The strange thing is, those who came to pray we're not churched people. 
It was as though the Christians had lost confidence in the Lord. The two of us as chaplains stood there with unchurched people. Some of them de-churched. Hadn't been to church in years. And we prayed. The attack never happened. We were so relieved. And then we said, we need to get into the lion's den. And so we prayed for the opportunity to get in and stand in front of that colonel and pray that Satan get exposed and brought down. We got that opportunity. The, the great thing was that the colonel even said amen. <laughs> Yesterday, my colleague chaplain messaged me and said, on Friday night, the colonel was taken away in cups. The system is coming down. When God fights on our behalf, it may not happen in our time because we want it on our calendar. Lord, you show up on this date at this time and you get this sorted out as we need it sorted out. But God doesn't do that. And we'll see in this name as to how he, how God does things. When he fights the battle, he teaches us something that is important that we need to learn. Now, one of the things that we do find is that often Christians shy away from hard things. I don't know why we do that. When something looks tough, we tend to shy away. Psalm 118, it's not a psalm so much as a prayer, but it's a psalm that shows us a cycle of what happens when God comes in and fights the battle for us and what, what in a sense happened afterwards after the psalm or post the psalm being written. It contains a call to worship. It says, what did God do in terms of him getting involved? What did it look like when God got involved? What was the outcome? What was the response of the people? And it then goes back into a call to worship, almost in a sense to say, repeat. Just keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that. Let's read this psalm, and we'll just allow the psalm to speak to us in those headings. And we just listen to the Word of God and allow the Word of God to do its work as we listen to what it's saying. First of all, the call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord because He is good and His love is eternal. Let the people of Israel say, His love is eternal. Let the priests of God say, His love is eternal. Let all who worship Him say, his love is eternal. But now what are they going to ask? Well, this is what he has done. In my distress, I called to the Lord. This is the only part of the prayer. In my distress, I called to the Lord. He answered me and set me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? It is the Lord who helps me. And I will see my enemies defeated. It is better to trust in the Lord than to depend on people. It is better to trust in the Lord than to depend on human leaders. Now notice this. What does it look like when God takes control? When God fights the battle? My enemies were around me, but I destroyed them by the power of the Lord. They were around me on every side, but I destroyed them by the power of the Lord. He says that twice. Those who are doing the Roman study will know in ancient literature when you say something twice, it's take note. <laughs> they swarmed around me, 
like bees, but they burned out as quick as a brush fire. By the power of the Lord, I destroyed them. I was fiercely attacked and was being defeated, but the Lord helped me. The Lord makes me powerful and strong. He has saved me. So what does it look like? The result of when God takes control? Listen to the glad shouts of victory in the tents of God's people. The Lord's mighty power has done it. His power has brought victory. His mighty power in battle. I will not die. Instead, I will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. He has punished me severely, but he has not let me die. And notice the response of the psalmist to the work of the Lord. Open to me the gates of the temple, and I will go in and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. Only the righteous can come in. I praise you, Lord, because you heard me, because you have given me victory. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. This is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy. Let us celebrate. Save us, Lord. Save us. Give us success, O Lord. May God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. From the temple of the Lord, we bless you. And notice, we come back to that call to worship again. The Lord is good. He has been good to us. With branches in your hands, start the festival. And march around the altar. You are my God, and I give you thanks. I will proclaim your greatness. Give thanks to the Lord, because he is good, and his love is eternal. You see what happens with the psalmist here? It looked like it was chaotic, swamped by enemies. Cried out to the Lord. Understanding that the Lord is the one who fights our battles. And look at the response. You don't hear too much about what the prayer said. But what you know is that the psalmist prayed. And there was a result. So how does this work? What, what is happening here? Well, let's go to the passage which we're looking at. It comes from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 17. It's a fairly short passage. The Malachites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of a hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went on top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on the scroll as something to, remem to be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner, or Jehovah Nissi. He said, Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So this name appears straight after the Israelites had come out of Egypt. Remember they had encountered God um, um, there at the springs of Mara, those, those bitter waters. And, and the Lord had spoken to them and had revealed that name, Jehovah Rapha, the, the Lord who is our healer. The God who, who, who wants to heal and to restore us. But as they move on from there, 
God wants to reveal something further about himself. Now, if God is going to reveal something about himself, you must remember that he needs to place us in a situation that will give us an opportunity to understand what he is going to say. God can't do it in theory. He doesn't send us a course and say, here's a lovely course. You, you go and do this course. You can do it online. You can do it from the comfort of your own lounge. Um, you can sit on, on one of those nice chairs where the bottom comes up, and you can just lie there. Um, and you can take this course, and you will learn all about the Lord in this course. No, God needs to put you and I into a real-life situation and in that real life situation, we learn what it means when he reveals an aspect of himself. So as they move from the springs of Mara, thirst quenched, feeling probably a lot happier as to how things are, they come to um, a place known as the desert of sin. Not because anything bad happened there, it was just that that was the name. Now, you didn't get that one, did you? No, the desert of sin. Oh, do I have to explain this one to you? <laughs> Here they ran out of food. It's not a good idea to run out of food in the desert. Any of you ever been in the desert? Yeah, yeah. Deserts are hostile places. Whatever you need in the desert, you take with you into the desert. They ran out of food in the desert. The logistics department was not working. Ran out of food in the desert. So they, what they do, they start to do what, what, what seems to be very good of them. They start to complain. You know what it's like when we're hungry and we complain. I'm hungry. I'm going to die. I'm hungry. I'm so hungry. And that's just after eating. Now they were starving. And so, after all this complaining, Moses and Aaron go to God. And they, they don't just ask, with, ask God. They plead with God. Please, do something. They're going to kill us. And probably eat us. And so God sends manna and quail. What do they do with the manna and quail? They complain. It doesn't taste like the food we had in Egypt, you know. But they still eat it. You think that this isn't enough yet? God's still going to reveal something else. You think at this point, are they under discipline? Is God punishing them? What is God doing to them? No, there's something further God's going to do or God's going to show them. They've got all the food that they need, but they don't have water. They run out of water again. Didn't fill up their canteens enough back, back at um, the Springs of Mara. They run out of water. And they do now what they are now really accomplished at doing. They complain. They really complain. Because you can last for a while without food, but you cannot last very long without water. And out in the desert, yes, you can last in a comfortable, nice, warm environment for, for um, three days without water. But I know with having worked up in the Sahara Desert, you won't last a day without water. You'll turn to powder very, very quickly. And so in the area of Rephidium, there they run out of water. They, they moan to Moses. There's no water. There's no sign of water. And God says to him, Moses, take your rod. And, and, and it's recorded in Exodus that Moses refers to it as the rod of God, the rod of Elohim, the God who is creator. 
and he takes this rod and and it's particularly referred to as the rod of God who is creator because God is able to create something out of nothing. He can create a situation that is now possible out of a situation that looks impossible. And he goes and he strikes the rock and water comes. At this point, these people are broken. You don't recover quickly. After you've been in the desert and you are very, very thirsty, it's not just one quick sip of water and you're fine and you're back to normal. There's a whole process of what your body goes through in rehydrating. There's a whole process it goes through if you've been starving of getting food in. You're not just suddenly, okay, I'm great, I'm happy. At that point, at the absolute lowest, this is the moment God can teach them. The Amalekites attack them at their lowest point. These are trained guys. Guys you train to fight in desert regions. These are trained armies. Israelites are not a trained army. They don't have many weapons. They're not well fed, they're not well watered. And they have no motivation. Now, those of you who've ever served in the military know this is a recipe for disaster. For somehow, reason or other, God thinks that this is the best recipe for success. You see, what's happening here is that the Israelites are being taught that if you go into war, you need to be out the way so that God can be in the way. God can fight this battle. You can't. And so Moses says to Joshua, choose some men who at least have some weapons. Choose them to go and fight against the Malachites. He said, myself and Aaron and her will go up on the hill where they can survey the battle and he will lift his hands to the throne of God. He'll pray. And while his hands were up, they were defeating the Amalekites. While his hands were down, the Amalekites were starting to gain ground. Put his hands up, they got pushed back. And after a while, you know what it's like putting your hands up. After a while, it just doesn't work well. Well, somebody's got to hold your hands up. Standing after a while, it doesn't work well. Somebody needs to bring a chair. Well, they got a rock. Sit on the rock. Keep your hands up. Moses, we're keeping your hands up. Aaron and her kept his hands up. Now, where was the battle being fought? The battle was not being fought in the valley. If I look at this from the point of view as a parent, when you've got something important to do, make sure your children have something to do. That they don't get out of hand. Just send some of them into the valley. Get them to do something. While the real work gets done up on the hill. The battle was not fought down there. The battle was fought. The battle was fought up on the hill. Now we learned something important from this. First of all, we need prayer warriors. If Mandra is ever going to come to know the Lord, it starts first and foremost with prayer warriors. We need errands and hers to hold up the hands of those who are praying. We need prayer warriors. Because there is a war happening in Mandra, for the hearts and the souls of the people of Mandra. And planted right in the middle of Mandra are several garrisons, churches, you may call them, garrisons. Some of them are garrisons of sleeping soldiers, 
And some of them contain garrisons of soldiers who are ready to move. Some are moving. But they don't go out with armor. They're lifting their hands to the throne and saying, Lord, will you fight this war? Because the outcome is too scary to even begin to contemplate. Going back to sitting with that family and trying to explain to them, you are going to die. And this is how you will die. That may sound frightening. It's even more frightening that there are many people in Mandra who won't die just a physical death, but will die an eternal death. It's even more pressing to say to them, you need to come to know Jesus. And for that to happen, we as a church need to be lifting our hands to the Lord. So how do we fight this battle? How do we do it? Philippians chapter 2. This is the application part. This is the part where you wake up now and the sermon's almost over. Looks are stretching out. We're getting ready for the closing song. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge or confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. We keep our eyes upon that Jesus. Our eyes upon Jesus. Not upon the chaos, upon Jesus. Our eyes are there. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. That is how you and I will fight this battle. Ask the worship team to start coming forward. We fight that battle from the mountaintop. Our eyes upon Jesus. Turning them upon Jesus. We can look out and go, oh, it's so terrible. If you found yourself talking about how terrible things are, well, now turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes there. You are Jehovah Nissi. You fight this battle. We can't. We don't know how to get into anybody's home. We don't even know how to even tell somebody about Jesus. We don't even know if they'll even listen to us. We can't fight this. We are ill-equipped. We don't even have the weapons. We don't even know what to do. We don't know where to begin. But you do, Lord. You do. Turn our eyes upon Jesus. We keep our gaze upon Him. We keep our hands lifted to the throne. Fight this battle, Lord. Fight it. Let there be victory. Let's worship the Lord.
It's how we fight our battles. Eyes turned upon Jesus. And you will see strongholds coming down. They will come down. And now what you've been waiting for is the cupcakes and the tea and the coffee. Let's receive God's blessing. Go now in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. If any of you would like to just receive any time of ministry, somebody to pray with you, somebody to just listen to what you need to say, remain here in the front while the rest of you go and grab some tea, coffee, some great fellowship.